Revelations chapter 19, starting to verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for what it teaches us and what it shows us. And I pray this day that you speak to us through your word, that you would speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to think about things maybe differently than we've ever thought about them before. And draw us closer to you, Lord, through this time as we look at your word. Please give me the strength to do this, Lord, and take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we're going to continue to look at the Apostles' Creed. And today, we want to focus on one word that's in the very beginning, the first line of the Creed, and that's the word Almighty. Now, we introduced last week the idea of the Apostles' Creed being a statement of faith, a summary of the essentials of Christian belief that was formulated in the centuries after Christ walked the earth. Now, it's not Scripture, and it's not meant to be Scripture, but it laid out for the often illiterate and uneducated masses of the dark and middle ages the basics of the Christian faith, and it laid it out in a way that was easily memorizable and easily understood. Now, the Apostles' Creed is not perfect. It does not lay out all the concepts and precepts of Christianity, but it covers the basics. You remove any one of the key points from the Apostles' Creed, and you would end up with something less than authentic Christianity. Now, the reciting of the Apostles' Creed, like we just did, is not really something that's a part of Baptist or evangelical tradition, but it is recited almost every Sunday in churches around the world, Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, and many other Christian churches. It's not something we want to repeat so often that it becomes something we just recite by rote, you know, and, and lose the meaning of it, but there is value to reciting and learning it so that we can gain a better understanding, a better grasp of what it is we believe as Christians. Now, last week, we looked at the first statement of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father. This morning, we focus on, I believe in God Almighty. Almighty. In a nutshell, the word pretty much means what it says, Almighty, all with two L's. God possesses all the mightiness that there is. Theologians use the term omnipotent. Omni meaning all, potent meaning power. God the Father has all the power that there is at his disposal. A.W. Tozer points out that the word Almighty is used in the Bible 56 times and that it's never used of anyone else except for God. One of the names given to God in the Old Testament was El Shaddai, which means God Almighty or God the All-Sufficient One. Sometimes when Gina leads worship, we sing a song called El Shaddai, and when we sing it, we're declaring that God is Almighty, and God is omnipotent. Millard Erickson defines omnipotence saying that God is able to do all things which are the proper objects of his power. Thomas Oden defines omnipotence as the perfect ability of God to do all things that are consistent with his divine character. The theologian Thiessen says that God can do everything that is in harmony with his perfections. These are some things, there are some things which God cannot do because they are contrary to his nature. God has power over his power. His power is limited only by his character. Odin writes that God cannot deny himself. God cannot be not good. God cannot be unjust. God's power must always be viewed in the context of his wisdom, his goodness, his justice. Absolute power, like the power that God possesses would be a disaster for the human race in the hands of anyone less good, less wise, less loving. God in his omnipotence cannot do anything logically absurd or contradictory. 
Some philosophers will ask the question, can God build, create a rock that it's too heavy for him to lift? Or can he create a square triangle? God's power is limitless, but it is also self-limited. He will not contradict himself. He will not do something absurd. And most of all, he will not use his power to do something that is outside of his nature, that will go against who he is. God's also not a genie in a bottle when it comes to his power. Sometimes we have this notion about an all-powerful God as someone who, who will answer all my prayers or get me out of any mess I may find myself in. He cannot arbitrarily do anything that, that we might conceive of just off the top of our heads. He is not at the whim of our whims. He will not simply place his power at our disposal just because we ask him to do something that we want, something we think makes sense that would not be in accord with his plans and with his purposes. Jim Carrey stars in a movie called Bruce Almighty that came out, what, maybe 15 years ago? At first, I didn't really want to watch it because I thought, oh, it sounds kind of sacrilegious. And, and actually, to be honest, a few parts of it are. But a lot of it poses the question in a very humorous way, important questions about how we view God and how we view his omnipotence. At one point in the movie, God, portrayed by Morgan Freeman, good voice for God, um, gives Bruce all of his power. And at first we see Bruce taking full advantage of it for his own benefit. Everything he does is for himself. But soon he's confronted by the prayers of millions of people. He sits in front of this computer and all these prayers start scrolling. He starts hearing them in his head and he asks Morgan Freeman, what is this? He goes, well, these are the prayers that you have to deal with. And not knowing what to do, he simply clicks yes on the computer and says yes to all the prayers. And the next day, you just see the chaos that results. The TV reporter comes on TV and says, something strange happened in the state lottery today. There were 800,000 winners, each one winning $4.23. There were prayers for different climate things that people needed. Some prayed for rain, some prayed for not rain, and the, the climate just ended up going haywire. And Bruce learns the danger of omnipotence without wisdom without goodness, without love, without caring for the best interests of others instead of himself. God's omnipotence, his almightiness, is for our good, yes, but it's also simultaneously for his glory. We don't always know what's best for us. I know it's hard to admit sometimes, but we don't always know what's best for us. Things we ask for, things we pray for, may be exactly what we don't need. But God's omnipotence is linked to God's character and to his will. And his will is never frustrated. Psalm 119.3 tells us, Our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. Now, if we were to take that verse by itself and just don't read anything else about God, we would go, hmm, he sounds kind of self-centered there. But when we understand that what pleases the Lord is to care for his children, when we understand like we talked about last week, that God is our Father and he wants the best for us, then we're able to surrender to his will and realize that what pleases him is also what is best for us. Though God in his omnipotence will not do the contradictory or the absurd, the Bible shows demonstrations of his power that that allow people to overcome what seem to be insurmountable problems and experience miracles. In Genesis 18, God appears to Abraham, introducing himself first and foremost as, as, I am the Lord Almighty. And then he tells Abraham that he's going to be the father of a great nation and that his wife Sarah, who's well beyond her childbearing years, will give birth to a son. And then being aware of Sarah's laughter and her doubt, God asks the rhetorical question, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer in God's omnipotence, his almightiness, is no. A similar discussion happens between the Lord and Mary, the mother of Jesus, as God lays out to her the plan for Jesus to be born of a virgin, and he proclaims that nothing is impossible with God. Jesus, in his discussion with his disciples, his disciples in Matthew 19, about how hard it is for a rich man to get into heaven, he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. He then qualifies that statement by proclaiming, Yeah, with humans, that's impossible, camel, to go through the eye of a needle. But with God, all things are possible. God can work in the heart of any person. 
and draw them to himself, whether riches stand in the way or indifference stands in the way or sin stands in the way. With humans, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And it is in this that we find our hope in God Almighty, for nothing is too difficult for him. No human heart has become so hard that he cannot soften it. No one has veered so far off the path of life that God has set out for them that they cannot be brought back. No sin we have ever committed is so great that God cannot forgive. God's power can change us. God's power can change the people around us that we love. God's power may not help us win the lottery, but his power can work where it counts, and that's changing human hearts. Erickson writes, we never need to, never need despair out of a belief that it is impossible to change human nature, whether our own or that of others, because God can work effectively even in this area. We're not doomed, we said this a few weeks ago, we're not doomed to the pull of our human nature. God's power can change us. God's omnipotence is most effectively on display not in making a square triangle and not in making a rock too heavy for him to lift, but in changing a human heart by his spirit and helping someone find forgiveness, helping someone find new life in Christ, helping someone discover what it is they were created for and helping them find their purpose in life and giving them what it takes to fulfill that purpose. God is almighty. He is omnipotent. He has all the power. And when he uses his power, he doesn't relinquish it. It's not like when you boost someone's car with your battery and power goes out of your battery to someone else's and your battery is a bit weaker. When he, he does, God does not become less than he is because he has given away power to help someone else. As we saw last week, he's not only omnipotent, he's also our father, our dad. A.W. Tozer paints a beautiful picture. He writes, A king sits on the throne, inhabits a palace, wears a crown and a robe, and they call him your majesty. But when his little children see him, they run to him and they call him daddy. It's astonishing to think about sometimes that the creator of the universe desires to have a relationship with me, with you. And not just any relationship, but one as a father to a son, as a dad to a child. It's incredible that one so powerful desires to draw so near. It's amazing that he desires to put his power at our disposal in our lives so that his will can be accomplished and that our good, what is best for us, can come to fruition. Tozer writes, God can untangle your life just as easily as he can do anything else because he has all the power there is, and he has all the wisdom there is. Yet throughout this discussion about God's omnipotence, about God Almighty, there is a question that haunts, and perhaps it's a question that's been going through your head as if, even as we've been talking about it, and it's this. If God is so all-powerful, how come there's so much suffering in the world? It's a question that people have been asking for centuries, The ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus wrote, God either wishes to remove suffering and is unable and thus is not omnipotent, or God is able but unwilling and therefore is not wholly good. A more recent philosopher, David Hume, wrote, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? Basically, they're asking, if God is all-powerful and good, then why is there evil in the world? This is a problem that theologians and deep thinkers have wrestled with for centuries, and we won't solve the problem today in 12 minutes. And in part, we won't solve it because we see it as a problem to be solved, and that's not really what it is. Peter Kraft, in his book, Making Sense Out of Suffering, writes that suffering is a mystery, not a problem. A problem lends itself to a solution, but a mystery involves contemplating it and having more light shed on it without perhaps seeing the complete picture. Erickson writes, we should not set our expectations too high in our endeavor 
to deal with the problem of evil. Something less than complete resolution will have to suffice for us. So while I don't pretend to have the solution, the answer to the question of suffering in an almighty God, I do hope to look at the mystery, shed some light on the mystery, maybe help us understand what that what we go through as humans and what God desires to do in our lives and through our lives. There have been two views on the issue of the omnipotence of God and suffering of humans through church history. And one's based on the concept of the human being's free will. In fancy language, it's called the Augustinian approach. And it deals with what is called moral evil, suffering and evil that can be traced to choices and actions made by humans with free will. God has given us this amazing gift called free will. For without free will, there'd be no love. For to love God or to love another human requires a choice. God did not wish to create a race of robots who would serve him by force or by being pre-programmed to do so. He has given us the freedom to decide to love him or to decide to ignore him. He's given us the freedom to decide to serve others or to think only of ourselves. He's given us the freedom to make decisions that could hurt others intentionally or unintentionally, or we have the freedom to help others. And every one of our choices has consequences. And sometimes the consequences of a human's free will um, choices are choices that can lead to suffering, suffering that they experience or suffering that is sometimes inflicted on others. For example, someone's choice to steal in order to satisfy their wants, will lead to another person experience suffering by going without with the thing, yep, going without the object stolen. Now, the second approach to the problem of suffering, called the Iranian approach, focuses on the notion that God brings good out of evil, and that God, in His wisdom, has a good and justifiable reason for suffering, and that is being the good that He brings out of it. There's more of a mystery here, I think, than the first approach, and it seeks to wrestle with the idea of natural evil, suffering that is not the result of the choices of humans, but is the result of living in this fallen, imperfect world, this fallen, imperfect nature. There are a few ideas that we can look at that hopefully will shed some light on the mystery for us and help us get a grasp on suffering in our lives and in the lives of those around us. First, suffering can be seen as training, as training. Richard Deering writes, as awful as suffering is, it is also one primary area in which our personality and our character grows. James 1, 2, and 4 tells us to consider it joy, pure joy, he says, when we face trials of different kinds, for the testing of our faith breeds perseverance. And when that perseverance has done its work, we become more mature, more complete as human beings and as spiritual beings. And so we ask, is God really less omnipotent if he knows that allowing certain types of suffering will allow us to become a more loving, less rebellious, less self-centered person? I was sick for six months during my, after my first year of Bible college. I was so sick that I couldn't go back to school. I lived in Montreal, the college was in Peterborough, and I had to miss an entire semester of school. And on one hand, it was a terrible experience that I hoped to never have to relive. But on the other hand, I think I learned more about God. I learned more about his character. I learned more about his goodness. I learned more to trust him in those six months, I think, than I had learned from any other experience in my life. And I came away from those six months also with a deeper empathy for other people who suffer. Could I say that God in his omnipotence and wisdom allowed me to go through that time as a training period that I might become more like him. Sometimes our view of suffering is skewed by what we believe to be the purpose of our existence. I can't remember, is it the Constitution of the US or the Declaration of Independence? One of the two, I was gonna ask Michelle, she's an American, I was gonna ask her if she was here. But one of those two talks about people having the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the pursuit of happiness is not why we're here. Peter Kreft writes, the point of our lives in this world is not comfort, It's not security, it's not even happiness, but training. It's not fulfillment, but preparation. He writes, this world is a lousy home, but it's a great gymnasium. Sometimes God allows suffering as a means of getting our attention, 
Catherine Marshall was a well-known Christian author of a previous generation, and she writes of her two-year struggle with tuberculosis and wrestling with the idea that God was using this suffering to try and get her attention about certain things in her life, and she wrestled with what those things might be. C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, famously wrote that God whispers to us in our pleasures, he speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. How God may be trying to get our attention is unique to each of us, unique to each of our situations, but suffering and, can, and pain can present us with a situation that is beyond our control, and it provides us with the opportunity to cry out to God, and to cry out to him in a way like we never have before, to cry out to a God who is in control, who's omnipotent, who promises to be with us through it all. The 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard writes, when a person suffers and is willing to learn from suffering, then he constantly learns about himself and his relationship to God. This is a sign that he's being trained for eternity. The concept and the reality of eternity with Christ is another fact that can shed light on the mystery of suffering. For in Romans 8.18, Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy not worth comparing with the glory that will be be revealed in us. Suffering takes on a different perspective when we think of it in the light of eternity. Where Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We often view God's omnipotence as the reason why evil and suffering should be removed from the world. But with an eternal perspective, with a perspective that this life isn't all that there is, then we can see God's omnipotence at work in the creation of an etern- eternal heaven, free from suffering from those of, for those who have suffered with Christ on earth. Another light on the mystery of suffering is to see it as completely under God's omnipotent control. Suffering rarely makes sense when it's happening. Though often, in hindsight, we can see God's hand at work, bringing about an ultimate good. Yet there are times when suffering doesn't make sense, even in hindsight. And we need to leave room in the mystery for an all-knowing, almighty, good God who has a perfectly good reason for allowing to happen what might seem completely haphazard and nonsensical. Job is the person we read about in the Bible who probably has suffered more than anybody except probably, except maybe Jesus. And yet he says in Job chapter 13, verse 15, though God slay me, yet will I trust him, yet will I hope in him. Job can't explain all that's going on in his life, but he's prepared to accept the possibility that God in his circumstances, that God is in his circumstances, and that God has a purpose of love behind it all. There comes a point sometimes when we simply have to trust in a good God who has a purpose to everything, who is completely in control, and who, because of his love for his creation, is bringing all things to pass for our good and for his glory. For God has a wonderful habit of taking things which cause suffering, taking bad and evil things, and turning it around to work it out for our good and for his glory. There are examples throughout scripture of this, but the most obvious one is Christ and his crucifixion on the cross. Christ experienced a measure of suffering that we can only imagine, both in terms of the physical suffering and in terms of the fact that he who knew no sin became sin for us. That a pure and holy son of God bore the horrible sin of every human, the sin of Hitler and Nero and Caligula and me and you that he bore the sin of every human who ever lived on his shoulders and died in our place. But out of that suffering, we can receive forgiveness. Out of that suffering, we can have new life in Christ. Out of that suffering, our sin is dealt with, and the enemy is defeated. The enemy might be able to hurt us once in a while, but he can't harm us. Jesus has conquered sin and death and hell, and it came about as the result of suffering. God, in his omnipotence, can take a situation that is full of suffering and that doesn't make sense, and he can work it out for our good and for his glory. 
What the enemy means for evil, God turns it for our good. And because of his omnipotence, because his plans are never frustrated, we can know that that the plan for our good and for his glory in the midst of suffering, it will be accomplished. Knowing who God is, knowing his character, knowing how much he loves us and has a plan for our lives helps shine a light in the mystery of our suffering and his almightiness, his omnipotence. We can see suffering as a training ground where, one, where our character is grown and we become more like Christ. We can see suffering with an eternal perspective, knowing that this world isn't all there is and that our present suffering will seem so small compared to the glory of eternity with our, with our dad, with our father. We can see suffering as a way that sometimes God needs to get our attention. And we can know that in the midst of suffering that God in his omnipotence holds us in his hand and has everything under control. And that whatever is reason for allowing the suffering, he is with us through it all, walking with us through the fire, through the storm, through the mess that our lives are sometimes. And he is walking with us in all of his power, in all of his almightiness. God is with us through our suffering in his omnipotence. And he is working all things out for your good and for his glory. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here and you've asked the question, what's the deal? If God's so wonderful and powerful, why are things so bad? There's no complete answer to the mystery, but God, I think, wants you to know that he's in control, that he has a plan, that he loves you, and he will never leave you alone. He's walking with you through every moment of any suffering that you're facing. And he wants to take all of that, which seems so lousy, and turn it out for good and for his glory. And I guess our question is, can we trust him? I remember when I was homesick for those six months, I remember one time just lying in my room feeling so horrible and I, all I could do to pray was just say the words, I trust you, 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 over and over again until I finally believed it. Take a moment with God, just you and him. Let him help you trust him because he is omnipotent, he is almighty. He has all the power to bring you through whatever you're facing. Take a moment, you and God, make this personal in your life.